What's up? My name is Morgan Page. We're here in Los Angeles in my studio. I'm going to give you a little look around. We're going to check out some of the gear and uh, talk about how I make music. So uh, starting out here, really old piano. I just got this. It's about 70 years old. It's a Steinway Studio Upright. And um, I'm going to actually be modifying this soon so that I can have an easier way to mic it. I'm going to put some an Earthworks piano kit mic in here. So it's sort of a temporary setup, but it's really cool just to be able to have some real piano sounds. I, I do use piano plugins, but just to have the real thing, to have that real sustain uh, is amazing. And there's a lot of cool stuff you can do, you know, to play prepared piano. You can hold the strings and mute the strings, but it's very loud with the cover off. But, you know, you could lean on the strings and, and mute things. So, really useful. Uh, you can even put tacks on them if you want. I don't know, guys like Deadmau5 have experimented with that. And uh, it's just great to have a real instrument that you can feel and it really kind of fills the room. Um, these are really crucial. You gotta have uh, digital candles in your studio for a little vibe. I like these for vocalists and so I don't burn down my studio. So these are handy. Um, and you know, little things like that help the session move along nicely. So moving along, uh, this is my keyboard I bring to on the road. I really like to have my hands on and to have, um, I can't really use the whole like cap lock, caps lock thing, you know, with Logic or with Ableton. So I like to have a real keyboard. This Korg one's really nice. You can daisy chain stuff into that. Uh, that's helpful. Really like these stands. Uh, you know, not many people get excited about stands, but I love uh, stands that don't fall over and that are rock solid. And you can attach multiple mics to these. So these are kind of like the Cadillac of mic stands. They're called uh, Mic King. So really useful, not cheap, but uh, so I have my main vocal mic over here and then I have just my piano mics right here. So that setup's gonna be changing. And you know, it's funny, every session a vocalist will come over and say, where's the lyric stand? And I always, I never had one until now. So we'd have to like paste the lyrics up against the soundboards and on the walls and, and or you'd hear them like rattling the paper as they're singing it. So very basic, but kind of a important piece of gear unless they can totally memorize their lyrics and they're Jay-Z or somebody. Uh, so moving along, um, really important part of my synth arsenal is the Prophet 08, made by Dave Smith. And this is the sound uh, that I used for body work. This is the sound I used for Fight For You. Those were sort of modified presets. And it just has that 80s vibe. There's just something with the way uh, when I play a preset, and I play, it makes me play a chord progression in a certain way and I immediately get an idea, and that's how I make songs. I do a beat, I do a catchy chord progression, I do some leads, a bass line, arpeggio, add a little more percussion and move on. And uh, typically I'll mute the leads and send that sort of instrumental to vocalists. You know, I, for a long time I was using just plugins and soft synths, and then you kind of get that itch for something analog, and you want something that it has that width of the analog sound, that warmth. And so I think it's really important to use contrast in your tracks, like have use digital oscillators, digital synths for that harder kind of sound to cut through. And then when you want a softer, uh, warmer sound, you know, maybe go for something analog. So I've got the Prophet there and I've got the Voyager and the Buchla easel. So that's a brand new thing in the studio. Those are kind of my three amigos in the studio for very different sounds. And they each have their own strengths and weaknesses and their own place in the mix. So I try to choose gear that occupies a, a different footprint in the mix. So uh, with these synths, I like to keep notes on you know the presets that I love or the knob positions. And if I write it on a post-it note, it's very easy to lose that and becomes trash. So um, I'll take tape, usually like masking tape or painter's tape. Um, this is actually electrical tapes. So don't use this. <laughs> this will leave an adhesive. So oh, here's an example. So this is painter's tape and get a metallic pen. So if it's a dark color tape, which painter's tape usually is, you could just um, get a white pen or a silver pen and write on there. And it's pretty simple. You know, mark your knob positions without ruining the, the finish of the synth and have everything very close as a reference. So I think that's really uh, an overlooked kind of basic part of studio stuff. 
So, and I've got these headphones here. These are my uh, long-standing go-to headphones that I have the, the vocalist sing with and I'll, I'll track mix downs with. These are kind of bright, but they sound amazing, Ultra Zones. Um, so really like those. Um, if I'm working on the road, like I was just on a bus tour, and if I have the luxury of the space for headphones this big, um, I'll bring along these. These are Audi's headphones. They sound really good. Uh, they're flat, but they, you know, still are just fun to listen to, really comfortable, um, kind of open ear, I guess. So you're, these are comfortable for long sessions. Um, so I'll either use these or Bose noise reduction headphones on the road. Um, the Bose are really, really good. I know a lot of people trash Bose, but those are absolute lifesavers while you're traveling. So really useful but they can be a little hard on your ears after doing long sessions. So use those more for the plane, for doing my mix show, and uh, just getting rid of that roar of the jet engine. So I've got those. Sometimes I'll use the Sennheisers. I used to DJ with these. I use Vimotas now. Uh, I just like the look and the feel of Vimotas. These are still amazing, still the standard. But um, these are great for tracking sometimes because they really kind of push up against your head. So these are the Sennheiser HD2s. And a um, really handy piece of gear that I have in here for handling all the different headphones is this little red cue box. It's made by Redco. They make custom cables, fun stuff like that. So um, another real basic thing that's really handy. Uh, you can control all the different levels. You know, a lot of times the vocalist wants it deafeningly loud and I don't want to wreck my ears while I'm tracking. So I have the vocalist stand right here, um, sing into this manly. Um, and uh, Manly Ref C, really, really good vocal mic. I think it's the Dr. Luke mic of choice. And so they sing in there. I crank them up really loud. And uh, that's always a, a tricky balance when you have a loud singer and you don't want it to distort, but they're very dynamic. So either way, I crank up their sound and try to bring them down in the computer so they're not peaking. So that is the headphone box. Moving along here. Um, again, sticking along with that theme of basic, basic things, uh, cheap MIDI interfaces and controllers are really handy. So the new thing I do now is if I'm recording myself playing piano and I want to control the session and I'm, you know, four or five steps away from the computer, I'll just launch the session with this. And you just start recording, play, rewind, do whatever you want, change levels, tweak the plugins, ride the gain if you want. Um, so just get a really long USB cord, plug it into a cheap MIDI interface, and you've got a little mobile station. Simple as that. So you could do that for recording guitar. Um, if you don't have an assistant or some friend who's helping you record, um, this is what you use. So I like that a lot. Very basic. Uh, and this is my vocal chain. So I have, I'm using a couple different converters. I'm using the, the Avid converters and also the Prism Sound Orpheus, which is really good. So uh, the vocal is coming from the Manly Ref C, coming into the Avalon Pre. I'm not using the compression on that. It's getting boosted. I'm manually riding this with the singers, really important. Very easy to overlook, manually riding and anticipating vocals. Um, I will use the plug-in vocal rider later on to even things out, but I try to use this when, I, you know, when they sing a really soft, segment, I'll, I'll crank it up, and when they're singing really loud, bring it down. That's coming into a Purple Audio MC77, and that is really good for just adding a bit more grit and texture, and it's a, basically it's an 1176 with a little extra sweetness on it. So really nice compressor to have. Uh, it's great for instruments too, just a good workhorse. And as you can see on here, I've penciled in my favorite settings so I don't forget. And a lot of times these older, you know, studio classics, things are backwards. So like the fastest attack is to the right, it's not to the left and things like that. So it drives me crazy. So I'll write that stuff down as a quick reference. I'll write my favorite ratios down. And you know, that's right on the surface. You could use tape or anything like that. So like on my dangerous controller here, sometimes I'll put I'll put actually tape there a slice of tape to mark a, a sweet spot, like a reference point, or pencil. So, But you don't want to wreck your gear. You never know. You may sell it. And so moving along through the chain, uh, the vocal is going to the LA-2A. And that's not really doing much at all. It's just adding 
a couple more tubes in the signal path and doing a very small bit of gain reduction if the singer's really loud. So I love gear like this that has only a couple knobs, does a very simple purpose, and uh, it's really useful. It's a classic. And they actually, I think the original technology for this was invented not too far from here at the Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena. So it's pretty crazy, building rockets and missiles and broadcast compressors. And here we have the push. This is a recent addition to the studio. Still learning it. I love the way it looks. I love the way it feels. I love to have a tactile interface like this. So I'm just learning it, but I love it so far. I really like the um, APC-40 as well. My VJ uses that for all the shows. So we did a 3D tour recently, and he was controlling everything with the APC. So this is not as much for the live setup, more for the studio and playing chords and triggering clips and thinking of different ways to approach the creative process and you know do a little less clicking with the mouse. So um, I'm always up for, for taking a little break from just clicking all day and doing automation. So really useful for that. Um, and moving to the center of the studio, this desk is uh, Sterling Modular, which is a really cool company. They custom built this for me, so it would fit this uh, motif, this Yamaha motif. I don't use any of the sounds in this anymore. It's just got a really good feel. It's got the same keyboard feel as like a DX7, and just has that uh, nice Yamaha feel to it. And um, I got the cinema display. Eventually, I'm going to put a uh, flat screen in the back. But uh, for now, it's that. And I've got the monkey banana monitors, which a lot of people have not seen these. These are these were an early version. Uh, it's a small German company. They sound really good, and I use them as a, a B reference to my focal SM9s. I just want to hear, they only go down to about 55 hertz, but um, it's just nice to have something connected to the desk so you can feel it kind of resonate with the desk a little bit. You know, I'll turn these up loud and flip back and forth between the two. Um, so I'm, for monitoring, I'm using the Dangerous ST. Um, and I use that to switch between sources and hear stuff in mono. Really important for the club environment to make sure stuff is really translating in mono, all the important elements. So, uh, yeah, Monkey Manners are there, using those to just as a, a second opinion on things. And I recently got the Focal SM9s. Absolutely in love with these. Um, Hardwell and Hard Rock Sofa recommended them, and then Zed was telling me about them. And Diplo just bought a pair, so they're doing amazing things. I don't know what they did with these speakers, but uh, it took me 10 minutes uh, to listen to them, and I just fell in love with them. So really good. They're on tube traps, which are really lightweight and easy, and it's so cool. You can move your speaker uh, and not scratch your floor, and these are really, really heavy speakers. I think they're about 90 pounds, 80, 90 pounds, so you need to be able to move things around and... You never know, it's LA, there's earthquakes, things like that, so you need a, a sturdy setup. Um, so I love those, and it's been a lot of experimenting in the studio to get it right. Um, it was a garage before, so we had to bring a lot of uh, diffusion in here, a lot of absorption, and I mean, you would click your mouse in this garage and it would sound like a gunshot. So it took a lot of money, and I tried to do it as cheaply as possible, but it took a lot of money to seal everything up just for the raw materials for this room. And, you know, I have neighbors that are like authors and, and they can hear a lot of things very easily. So I made sure that we used uh, a lot of really heavy reinforcement in the walls. But um, it's pretty basic. I think it's not, it's not a super complicated studio. There's no vocal booth. Um, all my gear that makes heat or noise is in the other room, so all my other converters that have fans and my computers and my drives, all that stuff's in the, uh, on the other side. So there's a hole in the wall where all the cables are going to that. And I love that sound. You know, right in here it's just a, a mini split, just to keep things cool. And you get such a quiet environment for recording vocals. It's unbelievable. The only thing I hear are UPS trucks, UPS FedEx, just a little, and you can almost never get rid of that stuff, unless you're underground. Maybe it's even worse underground, I don't know. Uh, okay, so that's the middle of the setup, and moving along here, to be honest, I don't use a lot of this stuff. I love these compressors, and I hope I get to use them a little more on this next record. These are the Daft Punk compressors. These are the Elisis 3630s. You've seen them in a lot of future music videos, and they sound great. They're about 60 bucks each, and 
it's cheaper than a plug-in. So I bought four of them, and I even put them in a rack with a power supply. It was like a cheap little, you know, lunchbox of compressors almost. But uh, they look cool and they sound good. Um, they're a dirty kind of compressor sound. And I think even Stardust, they use that for the for the beat, for the side chaining, for the vocals. Like it wasn't just the drums. So um, if you're looking for a cheap, good compressor, it's it's great. You know, I think it's easier to use software, but it's nice to have some hardware alternatives. And so I don't use this DBX too much. It's a classic compressor. A lot of rock guys use that for snares. That's good. Um, a lot of things I've sort of phased out with just good plugins like Waves does really good subharmonic, you know, bass enhancement stuff. So I don't use this as much, but uh, maybe I'll incorporate these on the next record. The Avalon U5s, these are DIs. Uh, I use these, all my synths go through these, all my upward gear. So I absolutely love these. They're super clean. They're really good if I'm, uh, you know, plugging in an electric acoustic guitar or a synth or anything. They sound great. And this Dramastic Obsidian, this is like an SSL clone, but even better. It's a really small brand, but um, they make amazing stuff. So you could use that in the whole mix or for tracking. So I might use that for tracking piano soon. And this crazy beast here is the Buchla Easel. It's, uh, I just got it a couple weeks ago and I've been working with Buchla and giving them ideas for future products, things like that. You've seen Buchla in uh, Dead Mouse's setup, you've seen all the crazy synths and uh, you know the ab absolutely monstrous modular setup people have. This is a more simplified version. It still will definitely take you down the rabbit hole and provide all kinds of happy accidents. It's got a, a keyboard that senses the electricity in your hand. Your hand actually breaks the electrical field. And so you can play uh, your sounds on that. So the, uh, the Buchla Music Easel Really cool for happy music accidents, uh, for creating great arpeggios. It's semi-modular, so you can kind of do stuff on the fly, patch things in and out, and you never know what you're gonna come up with. Uh, you could do amazing bass lines, you could make you know, complete noise with it, you could do leads. Uh, it has its own sound. It's, it's a different sound than Moog, and a very different sound than the Prophet and the Dave Smith stuff. So. Um, you can create really different complex timbres that you can't get with other synths. Uh, but the way it's organized is really crazy. I mean, you don't even deal with LFOs or filters or resonance or even the standard uh, attack, decay, sustain, release. It's a whole different beast. You get just a few of those, attack, sustain, and decay. And uh, it's got a spring reverb built into it, a hardware spring reverb, which is one of the best things about it. So that's really cool. And you've got this card on here so you can actually circuit bend and you can touch the patches and change the sounds as you move along so that's pretty crazy uh, and you got the Moog Voyager of course uh, so I love this for bass lines it's good for leads too but I always come back to doing bass lines with it it's something about the sound on this it, you don't have to really compress or EQ it that much it just sits especially as you know a mono sound which it is I mean, you can always do it in stereo too and, and do filter offsets, things like that to create width, but just sits in a track really nicely and um, just a classic synth to have in the studio. It's a cool piece, just, just the vibe of all the Moog stuff's really good. I love all the industrial design, all the, the feel of the knobs. Um, I think out of all the synths, it has the highest quality to the feel of it. So you just really want to grab these and, and move them around. And, but it's cool to see the difference because it's like with knobs, you're going to use those differently than you are with sliders, and that changes the creative process. Or, you know, and you're going to change, it's going to change how you work to have a capacitative keyboard like that uh, versus MIDIing something up, doing it that way. So, all these little things will change how you create, and, and the timbre of the sounds and the oscillators are going to change, you know, the music that you make and change the way you play your chords and play your leads. So, Really cool differences, and that's uh, basically my studio. All right, we're here in my studio going through my favorite synths. Uh, starting here, this is the Dave Smith Prophet 08, and uh, I use this for a lot of my tracks like Body Work and Fight For You, and a lot of my new stuff for the next record that I'm working on right now for 2014. So uh, I just love to kind of dig in. Uh, there's a few presets I love that have this 80 sound to them, and I love this one. I think it's called French Horn. <laughs>
got a saturation to it I really like. And you can add in unison for like, you know, even fatter bass lines or leads. <laughs> Uh, and I like to switch on the sync mode, syncing uh, oscillator two to oscillator one. Sometimes turning that off and on. If you want a, a lusher kind of sound, I might leave it off. That's a cool preset. Very 80s sound. Uh, there's a few others in here that I like. Let's see. So just playing a progression like that instantly gets you in the mood. And uh, you know, a whole track can be born out of just one great preset. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the Buchla Music Easel right now. This is the newest piece of gear in my studio. Uh, I'm always looking for kind of unconventional ways to do things and kind of switch up the creative process. And this is definitely unconventional. It's got a suitcase, kind of hard shell case it comes in. And you've got a lot of different ways to route the audio around. So it really invites uh, experiment, experimentation and just sort of happy mistakes and happy accidents. You can uh, filter things in, you can bring audio in, you can feedback, send feedback into itself. Um, and there's just a lot of knobs, a lot of sliders here to work with. So uh, you got a keyboard. You can do an arpeggio like that. So I'm just gonna mess around with some sounds here and um, we'll see what happens. Portamento. And there's a spring reverb that I love on here. So when you play up like this, there's this great spring reverb sound. It's built in, so it's actually like a hardware spring tucked in somewhere underneath here. What I like to do is just sort of get, uh, you know, chord sequence or start doing an arpeggio and tweak the controls as the arpeggio is kind of holding. This is a really basic sound. It's just using both of the oscillators. One is on a square wave. They're both on square waves right now. But you can, it's almost like playing Operation. You can start uh, pairing things up, but you don't have to commit to plugging it all the way in. You can just touch it briefly. So I can go like that without having to put the whole thing in there. So these are banana plugs. This is the first uh, sort of modular synth I've had. It's a semi-modular. So I have no idea what's going to happen now. We'll see what Let's see. So I can set the, uh, you know, everything to modulate almost anything on here. So what can we do? Pulsar is kind of like the LFO, so we could just mess around with some different sounds here.
it's just crazy. It's like it's alive. You know, you've got this crazy analog synth. Sometimes you get musical results. Sometimes you get really atonal, bizarre sounds like that. You know? back to like a more uh, standard sound. See just that by accident I've kind of created a cool little bass patch. That's where you really get those cool moments. Um, you, you know, a lot of the stuff that Daft Punk does, you can tell they love their modular synths. And they used a lot when they did Tron and things like that. But it's that little expressiveness of a little bit of randomness, randomness happening with the filters and the way things are modulated. Something just different that happens in the creative process. So I love it. <laughs> So here's my original analog synth purchase, the Moog Voyager, and absolutely love this. And uh, I try to put in a track whenever I can, just to really fill out that bottom end. And so I'm gonna play you a couple patches that I love. So just huge fat sound. I love the Moog filters. And there's that old trick they told me you can actually touch some of the metal parts to get uh, to exaggerate the touch screen. So cool little trick. Classic, very simple, filtered Moog sound. That's the Mug Voyager. <laughs> 